Thank you so much for being here. My name is Kate Paisani. I'm the director of CARLA, which is the center that is um, sponsoring this talk today. We're located at the University of Minnesota. Our presenter today is Amanda Swearingen, and she is a PhD student in uh, second language education in the Department of Curriculum Instruction here at the University of Minnesota. And we're really delighted to hear her speak today about searching for social justice, engaging critical consciousness and dialogue dialogic pedagogy through critical participatory action research. We will leave the chat open during the talk, but Amanda will entertain questions at the end. So I will go ahead and pass things over to Amanda. Thanks so much for being here today, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate, for the introduction. Um, like Kate said, my name is Amanda and I'm uh, really delighted to be here today. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Carla, um, and the Carla community for their continued support in my work um, and for the inspiration a lot uh, in my work as well, um, especially in terms of social justice. Um, and, you know, I want to also begin by acknowledging the context in which we're having this talk. Um, we are in Minnesota and Minneapolis, um, and I recognize the gravity of having a talk titled Searching for Social Justice in a time and in this particular moment in which we're awaiting the verdict of um, whether or not we will see justice or continued injustice in the murder of George Floyd. Um, we're also grieving the loss of other uh, people of color, namely Dante Wright, Adam Toledo, um, we're witnessing continued hatred and violence in our Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. Um, and we're continuing largely as a society to ignore the disappearance and murder of indigenous women. And all of these um, issues are swirling around in the context in which we are engaging in, in research and engaging in the reconstruction of education. Um, and so I wanted to give us just a minute of, of silent reflection time um, to think about the context in which we're doing our work and to think about what brings you to the talk today and what brings you to explorations of social justice. So let's take a minute right now to think about that. What is social justice mean to you and how are you engaging with social justice in your work? It's a very loaded term. So let's just take a minute to think to ourselves about that. Um, if you want, feel free to drop a comment um, or a question into the chat. Um, if not, just keep live in your headspace for a minute. And listen to the sound of your breath and what that means in the context of today. Um, I know a minute is insufficient to address anything to any degree, but particularly this idea of justice and injustice. Um, but hopefully through today's talk and through your own reflection, as I share some of the work I do as a teacher educator, you'll be able to um, think critically about the work that you're doing within the context in which we're doing it. Um, and I know it's important to always start with some kind of baseline on what social justice means, but I'm gonna ask for your patience a little bit because I'm gonna kind of get a, 
have a roundabout way of getting to this notion of social justice. Um, and today I'm gonna be focusing on um, my use of participatory action research or rather critical participatory action research in my own classroom um, alongside my students. And we looked at this as a way to do or perform education differently than how most of us have experienced it. Um, and so again, here we go. Um, I encourage you to use the chat, but also uh, feel free to email me, feel free to tweet. Um, I'm an avid tweeter for any talks. I don't know if that's the right term, but um, to extend the conversation, I really welcome this. I welcome the learning opportunity. So I'm gonna describe first the context in which I'm working in, particularly the course context, and then describe why I felt the need alongside with my students to turn towards a different way of doing education um, and why we settled on uh, PAR, participatory action research, and specifically what our PAR project looked like and, and what the process was that we, um, that sort of unfolded organically in our doing of PAR. And then I'm gonna share um, some thematic analysis of the reflections we did at the end of the course after our PAR project had quote unquote ended. Um, and then I'm gonna circle into this notion of social justice and how we as a community in my class searched for social justice and what we were learning and how we were rereading the world. Um, and then I'll end today with um, a discussion of some of the lingering contradictions that I'm having in my own reflections of my work in social justice um, in language teacher preparation. So to give you an idea of this context, I do teach a course within um, an undergraduate minor and certificate program in teaching English as a second language. Um, and the course that I am specifically looking at today is called Intercultural Communication and English language teaching. And um, my work with PAR really began in the spring of 2020. So I'm gonna focus on that particular semester and the work that we did. Um, I've since done um, the fall semester and then the current semester where we're looking at PAR as well. Um, and in this course, we've designed the course. I you know, had the opportunity to work with a colleague on new to begin designing the course from a critical lens. And then I also began, um, or I also continued that work in a way of trying to understand what my conceptualization of criticality is from an intercultural perspective. And so I'm really framing this course um, in a way that views education both as a site of reproduction of inequity and a site for possibilities of, of transformation. And so um, in the course, uh, and I think this is a very important thing to understand about this context, students come from a variety of backgrounds um, academically um, and then interculturally as well. So in this particular course um, in the spring 2020 semester, there were 17 students all of them were part of the minor program. But you can see here, they came from a range of majors from language-based um, and culturally-based uh, majors to um, much more uh, cognitive ways of viewing the world and positivist lenses. Um, and so they come into this space um, with varying degrees of understanding of understandings of the world from an academic perspective. Um, and with varying degrees of experience with this notion of teaching. And so I had uh, seven students that came in through um, licensure track programs, five in elementary education, one in early childhood, and one in special education. And then I also had a master's of education in leadership and education student. And so this is really important because um, the Everybody, is, everybody in the course experiences some degree of disequilibrium in how they are understanding what it means to be a teacher of English. Um, and as they're learning about the coloniality and the hegemonies embedded in the practice of teaching English, as well as the imperialist spread of English. Um, and so sometimes students come in having had these conversations, but more often than not, they come in having never thought um, much 
or to any large degree about the political nature of the teaching of English. Um, and, you know, the course is really a breadth course. So we introduce these notions of hegemony, colonialism, um, localization, linguistic imperialism, uh, in both intersectional and intercultural identity formation, racializing meta narratives, um, racial linguistic ideologies, as well as heteronormativity. I mean, you get the idea. It's, it's designed to introduce students to a, a wealth of content um, that has the potential to stay at that surface level. But we always are trying to dig deep, dig deep, dig deep. It's sort of the motto of my class. I'm sure my students get tired of hearing me say to dig deep. Um, and the majority of the assignments um, as Anu and I um, uh, plan them and as I've continued working on are very, uh, are very much grounded in this archeology span of the self and this uh, autoethnographic and narrative um, discovery of who we are as, as humans, as intercultural beings. Um, and so again, students come to this course having various interactions and degrees of interaction with this notion of social justice. Um, but I think one of the most consistent aspects here is that they come in with an understanding of social justice from um, an academic perspective, um, not often from a lived experience perspective. And so you know, this idea of social justice becomes this woke conversation you're having um, with, you know, your friend at like a trendy coffee shop. Um, and it's, you know, sufficient to feel woke without ever really doing the hard work, right? But as we get into these conversations and we really confront um, the problems with leaving it at that superficial level, um, we begin to understand that conversation itself is part of the problem. And, you know, so this really led to us trying to reconceptualize our class from um, this notion of let's have discussions and critical reflections about social justice and inequity to being uncomfortable with just having those conversations. And so our commitment to building um, a dialogical classroom really arose from our frustration with the, the overall absence of action or any, any desire to you know, bleed into action in terms of social justice. Um, and this was not just in my class, but all of their educational experiences up until they came into my classroom. And, you know, we reflected on time and time again, we talk about these big issues, um, you know, but we remain in our classroom space and it remains the job of the teacher educator to deliver the message of social justice. Um, and what this ha what what happens here and what we reflected on is that we were reducing theory to this notion of pure verbalism or intellectualism um, and we really needed a pedagogy that would allow us to push our developing critical consciousness of our relationships with the world um, towards praxis towards action um, and so that's really how we came to par and you know, I came to par also in my own reflection work that um, as a teacher educator, there's no way for me to meet the, the field standard of trying to instill lessons of social justice in ways that um, help push our teacher, our prospective teachers towards um, dispositions and knowledges that um, result in the desire to teach for emancipation or, or teach for liberation. Um, it was never, it's, it's not possible, right? And so I began to think, well, how can teachers, how can we ask teachers to practice liberation when they themselves have not learned from any sort of liberatory perspective or praxis overall? Um, and that question really, you know, hit home with me. Um, and that's how we came into this work. So um, we thought about how um, our classroom should be a site of this dialogic discovery and dialogic education, um, where authentic education is not carried on 
by teachers for students or by teachers about students, but rather um, by teachers with their students. And all of this interaction involves this dynamic conversation between teachers and students and the world. Um, and all of that is mediated by the world and we're impressed um, by the world that we're experiencing. And so a dialogic approach to education really is rejecting this traditional teacher-student relationship that's undergirded by the unidirectional depositing of teacher knowledge um, that's somehow consumed by students um, without any kind of problematization. For me as a teacher educator who focuses on criticality and focuses on social justice, um, it has become imperative in my work that my students are not parroting or not ventriloquating the lessons I'm, I'm talking about here, right? And so we needed an epistemological shift in which knowledge could be co-constructed and um, co-produced uh, uh, by me as, as a teacher and student and by the students as students and teachers. And so for us, dialogue is really this moment where we can meet to reflect on the realities that we're co-constructing, the knowledges that we're co-constructing simultaneously and deconstructing and reconstructing at the same time. Um, and so all of this centers around what I think is super important and that's critical consciousness. And critical consciousness in dialogic education um, understands that knowledge should be critically examined and re-examined re because we need to make our realities that are so familiar to us um, seem or become unfamiliar. And it's that um, relearning, this unlearning and relearning that becomes crucial to understanding how our lived experiences are contextualized within these larger socio-historical systems. Um, and uh, critical consciousness is really this struggle of becoming. And it's, um, for me, I think a crucial step towards um, enacting social change. And I think this is um, often taken up in ways where that notion of action is left out of this conversation around critical consciousness in a Ferrarian sense. Um, and a lot of times critical consciousness becomes um, a proxy for dispositional work. And, you know, that's where we see some of the critique that comes in against critical consciousness. For us, I wanted to balance that dispositional work with the action work. The, the praxis is the key for us here. And so this led us into PAR. And, um, you know, I'm going to give just a brief introduction to PAR um, on the assumption that uh, we've probably all heard of this and have a sense of what PAR is. But we know that experiencing anything in the world means that we're um, participants in that experience, but we're also um, impacting that experience. Um, and it's not a passive um, formulation, right? And a lot of times we think of schools, school spaces or classroom spaces as these um, cocoons or, or safe havens from the outside world and everything in the outside stays on the outside and teachers feel this urge to shelter their students from the outside world. And what this, what happens here is that our classroom spaces become um, falsely neutral um, and we believe in that neutrality of the classroom space. And I wanted to really disrupt that for my students in my own classroom because the reality is that whether or not we want to believe it, teachers and learners together are carrying the world into our classrooms. Um, and that cannot be ignored. It cannot be overlooked because it impacts everything we're doing. Um, and despite all that we're bringing into the classroom, we remain steadfast in the way that we're constructing knowledge in classroom spaces. Um, we have remained in this uh, or embracing this idea that knowledge is really a top-down treatment of experience um, and dissemination of knowledge comes from the teacher to the student. And that's not true. We have um, myriad funds of knowledge, community cultural wealth that our students are bringing into the classroom. And 
you know, so participatory action research, the power of this is it flips that discussion. Um, it's really the opposite. It's a systematic approach to personal, um, organizational and structural transformation. It's very intentional and transparent in the political endeavor that it's engaging in. Um, and it foregrounds human self-determination, the development of critical consciousness and positive social uh, change as central goals of what PAR is trying to enact. And so PAR uh, focuses on this community. You can see here, it's this interaction all embedded within this scope of community. And community becomes a very important part of everything that we're doing. And this is, again, um, kind of axiologically different from how we think of education, particularly in the United States, as this individual endeavor. Um, when you've placed community as the, the unit of everything, it, it changes how we think about education. And PAR is very, it is deeply relational in that way. Um, and any kind of transformation um, is a relational transformation. And the power of PAR in that community is that the community can identify um, issues of concern, issues of injustice, and they have the power and the ability and the knowledges to um, learn more and research more, and research, I use this very broadly, and um, come up with uh, solutions to very real problems. Um, and I think this is important because we want to view social justice or injustice rather from a pragmatic lens. It's a very real problem that we need solutions for. We cannot tolerate the, the conversation without the action. There needs to be solutions. And PAR reframes um, participants or co-researchers critical, uh, critical consciousness in ways that become responsive and adaptive to the community. Um, and in PAR, for us, there are, there are you know, several different um, kind of outcomes or potential goals for, for change. And we were focusing on one in particular, which is the development and the expansion of our critical consciousness of ourselves as participant co-researchers. Um, so our PAR was focusing on the topic of the school to prison pipeline. Um, I know this is a very real issue um, and it deserves way more attention than I'm going to give it today. Um, the focus of the talk for today is really focusing on um, how my students engage in their critical consciousness of, of education overall. Um, but our, our topic for PAR was on the school to prison pipeline. And if you're unfamiliar, the school to prison, prison pipeline is this construct that's used to describe um, certain policies and practices um, in public schools in the United States that really decrease the probability of school success for children and youth and increase the probability of negative life outcomes, particularly through involvement in the juvenile justice system. Um, in other words, the school to prison pipeline is a causal chain between school policies such as zero tolerance, um, the disciplinary actions that result from these, such as um, suspensions and expulsion, and long-term negative outcomes, for example, um, increased uh, school dropouts and juvenile detention, and all this chain disproportionately impacts students of, colors, of color. And so for us, um, as we were getting into PAR and we were learning about PAR and what PAR could do, we began reflecting on who we were as a community. And that reflection was, was crucial because we began to understand that we all come to our class space with um, myriad intersectional identities and lived experiences. Um, but at the heart of it, we are all training to be teachers. Um, and the reality of it was that the majority of us were white teachers. And so when we were brainstorming this issue and thinking about who we were as a community, um, we became very passionate about um, making visible what wasn't necessarily visible to us in the past, which was the school to prison pipeline. Um, and we became very passionate about 
disrupting the pipeline in our own work as future teachers. Um, and so our process consists of learning about PAR and then reflecting on our community and brainstorming this issue. When we settled on the school to prison pipeline, um, then we begin learning more about the issue. And we develop these action pathway groups um, that students, you know, again, students were basically involved in every decision. Um, they were leading the, the charge, if you will. Um, and they decided to, to think about, well, what are their skills and passions for how they want to engage with this work? Um, and they sorted themselves into these action pathway groups. So we had um, one group looking at expert outreach, um, another group that was developing resources for teachers, another group that was trying to make contacts, uh, contacts with local legislators. And then we also had a social media activism group. And all of these groups were working to um, research the school to prison pipeline um, but they were doing so in different ways and they were organically engaging in these uh, cycles of um, reconnaissance, uh, planning, uh, action, implementation, reflection, and assessment. And they just continue to do that. And they, you know, cons uh, consistently adjusted and adapted as needed um, as they were carrying out their plans. Um, and then again, we ended the PAR project with um, a lot of reflection. And this reflection was both individual um, as well as uh, collective reflection, uh, reflection. And again, the dialogical nature of doing PAR meant that um, all voices were able to be heard. So I was very explicit um, earlier on in the semester in doing community building work and doing the identity work. And we worked over several class periods to um, think about our rules of engagement and critique those rules and um, think about ways that um, we engage with the rules we're creating in, in different cultural ways. And so we were massaging these consistently throughout the semester. And that became imperative um, in the, the way that we were able to dialogically um, create the, this space where we could hear each other, we could listen and actually hear each other. And we were willing to um, throw ideas out, even if they might be rejected ultimately. And it, the community in the, in the course was really fundamental to being able to do this work. And so I'd like to turn now to um, the reflections that we did um, at the end of the semester. So at the end of the semester, um, we had spent, uh, I think roughly eight full classes of 32, 30, 31 maybe, something like that, um, dedicated entirely to PAR. And this was, you know, the, 2020 spring semester when COVID hit and we had, you know, changed from in-person face-to-face class to um, synchronous remote instruction. And there was a lot going on. Um, but I think I, I, we knew we had something special when people wanted to continue. We talked a lot about this. They wanted to continue the work and they acknowledged the new constraints they were they were placed under, and it shifted things. And you know, rather than seeing it as an impediment to our consciousness raising, we saw it as an opportunity to further and more deeply engage in the work of of what it meant to be a teacher who who understands the way that um, students are racialized in our schools, and. It was a very powerful experience. And so I asked the teachers, um, the teacher scholars and my co-researchers, AKA my students, to reflect on the way that they understood the world now after having completed this or completed this PAR project. Um, we know that in a more dialogic or problem posing, uh, posing education, um, people develop the power to critically perceive the way that they're existing in the world um, that they're finding themselves. And they 
need to understand that the world is not a static reality and the reality um, or our realities are all in process or in this state of becoming. And so for us, PAR really catalyzed our rereadings of the world. And I'm going to present these as rereadings um, because they were for us quite transformative. The PAR project, our PAR project made us ask why the world is the way it is um, and why we do things the way we do them. And how can we create a more just world? It made us more conscious of our positions um, and how those positions were tied to systems of oppression that maybe some of us weren't completely aware of and uh, prior to the PAR project. Um, or at the very least, we weren't completely aware of the histories of these systems of oppression. Because a lot of times our privileges obscured those. And we became more conscious of the possibilities and the strategies for transgressing the artificial boundaries that are often imposed on us by the vested interests of those systems of oppression. And so in these re-readings that I'm going to present, I am going to use the first person plural we and us because um, I am part of this community. I am part of learning. Um, I am part of um, decision making. And so uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna present this in a collective fashion, if you will. And I'm gonna speak uh, specifically about our re-readings of learning, our re-readings of schooling, and our re-readings of racialization. So in terms of re-reading learning, um, as we began navigating PAR, we were really confronted quite early on with the ways that learning had been constructed for us, but also by us. Um, every single one of us reflected on how um, we had been asked to absorb lessons on inequity as if they would somehow translate or mag magically morph into some ability to act upon them. Um, and class after class, we thought um, uh, throughout rather our educational experiences had really socialized us um, into this compassionate conservatism where we feel empathy uh, towards inequitable uh, realities, but we're not, we never really move into um, countering those. And this compassionate conservative, conservatism led us to be, um, we realized we were being quite passive in our responses to inequity. Um, so we see here, Michelle is reflecting and she says, in other classes, we've talked about issues before, but that, that kind of is, as far as it goes, is talking about it. That's a huge issue that I have with a lot of the classes, especially in the elementary education program. A lot of what I've experienced is that we'll talk about something, but we won't actually do anything about it. We just sit and talk about things or we don't mention things at all. And so we realized that we had kind of banked the intellectualism of verbalizing the world without ever really striving for any kind of true liberatory action. And before PAR, we were actually quite willing participants in reproducing those conditions for our future students. Um, and so PAR was, was quite um, revelatory for us in understanding what it actually means to be a critical pedagogue. And this led to a lot of initial resistance to PAR. So when I first um, was reading my students' reflections and saw that they were frustrated and I was frustrated and we needed to transform everything, um, everybody was real excited, like, yes, let's do this. Um, but then once they started getting into it, they're like, whoa, 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 <laughs> hold up here. Some, no, like this is not, no. Um, and the resistance here came about because our emotions were tied to what we understood to be learning. Um, and we resisted 
because we felt confused and we felt uncertain um, that there wasn't a clear pathway, right? We didn't know what the ending point was. Um, and that was very unsettling. And I think more disturbing for us was our realization that we were skeptical in our abilities to actually enact change. Um, so we see here, Karina says, at the beginning of this project, I was definitely feeling very overwhelmed about how to tackle these topics because they're such large issues and they're so systematic that sometimes just looking at them, it's kind of like, well, what can I do in my daily life? How's this gonna change anything? But um, as we got deeper into our PAR work, we began to understand and value that the iterative process of communication, of dialogue, of reflection and action, um, it turned our purely um, verbal or intellectual understandings of the world into action. And that was the magic. That was the magic for us. Um, it helped us sort of transgress that that process helped us helped us transgress our resistance our initial resistance here and so um let me go here um that resistance into action is captured pretty aptly by by jennifer who says the school to prison pipeline was something that i voted for right away I realized that I've had so many classes that have tackled this within the university, but we're not really, uh, but we've not really discussed how we as educators or university students, how we can confront these issues through an activist lens. That is taking smaller steps and eventually create an impact. As a result, I was able to truly use all that I know about the issue within our education system and share with my classmates. More than that, I was able to witness my classmates tackling different areas of activism within this one issue, which can truly help our voices be heard on such a big issue in our country. So again, that community work and the community struggle of engaging in, in these dialogic practices and then the reconnaissance and the doing of PAR um, was, was very powerful. And it was powerful because, um, well, for many reasons, but um, it also allowed us to reimagine relationships. And again, this was important because we often envision our schooling from an individualist lens in the United States. Now, not always, but often. Um, and the ability to reimagine relationships um, meant acknowledging that the teacher was not this sort of God level knower of all things um, and a person who is imparting um, lessons onto their students, um, but a teacher is in fact still a student. A teacher can and should acknowledge that they're still learning. Um, and this helped us understand that we wanted our future students to, um, to take that lead, to take that initiative. Um, and we didn't wanna stand in the way of that. Um, we recognize that our students are bringing all of these skills to the table. And if we're not um, setting up our classroom spaces in a way that allows those skills to, um, to be engaged and to proliferate, then we're always going to be standing in the way. Um, and so we see here, Melissa saying, I wasn't really analyzing a lot of the power in situations and thinking about the different ways that power was showing up in interactions I was having with my students. As a white woman who's going into the teaching profession, it's super important that I'm aware of that power um, differential so that my students who may not have had or who may not have the same identities as me are still feeling supported in my classroom. So again, we began to understand that power was embedded in all of our interactions here. Um, it also reminded us of the importance of community. Right. Um, we needed to be able to talk about what changes we wanted to make, what we were doing well, what policies we wanted to change. And we found that our voices were amplified um, and our power was amplified when we made moves together as a community. 
And so ultimately Parr enabled us to fight against this sort of false dichotomizing of theory and action, um, student and teacher, um, expert and novice. And it pushed us to reread learning as dialogic, as practical, and as community driven. And all of these are fundamental characteristics of education for liberation. Um, and in learning how to, or relearning rather, how to learn, it, it also opened up the possibilities for how we could reread schooling or education as a whole. And so that's the next thing I wanna talk about here is this rereading of schooling. Again, we know that teaching is a political act and education um, is vital as a basis for political engagement and radical social change. Um, but we need to understand that um, the engagement and transformation that's required um, requires us to understand what exactly needs to be changed. Um, and doing PAR allowed us to connect schools to society. And this seems like something very simple, but again, the conversations we tend to have are academic in nature. So to see that connection in practice um, was vital for us. And negotiating PAR and learning about the school to prison pipeline um, made that connection more salient for us. And so we have um, our students uh, or my co-researchers really reflecting on how everything is so intertwined. All these different inequities um, are working together. Um, and a lot of things tie back to education. Um, and the reality was many of us were unaware prior to doing this PAR project, we were unaware or maybe slightly aware of the school to prison pipeline. Um, and that is a disturbing realization. Um, and so PAR unearthed our comprehension of the way, the different ways of experiencing schooling. And so we have here Nicole say, I didn't know anything about the pipeline before the project. I'd heard of it and, it, and that was mostly it. So when uh, the more I read about it and the more I learned about it, the more I understood about how important it is and I understood why we were working on it. This project was helpful for me um, of understanding the school system more, understanding how many students don't have the experience that I did. I grew up in a small town and my school was mostly white. I learned a lot. And so again, we were able to see the ways that we had been erasing particular um, experiences of schooling. I'm not gonna read this quote here because um, I wanna make sure that I get through some things, um, but making erasure visible is, a, is crucial to understanding the ways that we are performing inequity. We also began to understand that schools are sources of policing. Um, the policing of schools is an extension of the prison ideas and philosophies. Like schools should be strictly managed and should be rigid and oriented towards order. A lot of us hadn't thought about that because that's just what we were used to. And we weren't the ones experiencing um, the inequitable side of that performance. Um, to the degree that students of color experience. And this um, realization of the way that schools are set up helped us understand that we have the power to create and implement policies in our classroom. As we see here, Emily says, somebody in our class said something that really stuck with me. They said, every time you send a student out of the classroom into the principal's office, it opens a gateway to the pipeline. And I never really thought about it that way before. Sending your students out of the classroom doesn't help their learning and it could just be starting this cycle. That's something I'll be paying closer attention my, uh, for myself. The policies I decide to set around behavior, because most of the behaviors we see as dis disruptive, sometimes they're not really disruptive. They're just not the norm. They're not seen as the norm in our classroom or Western culture. So again, um, our ability to disrupt schooling 
um, centered around our ability to understand the policies we were engaging with. And we talked at length about knowing our students and their lived experiences and their identities. Um, and we tried to make sense of that in, in terms of the political nature of schooling. And most importantly, I think uh, none of us left the PAR project um, still feeling that education was in any way an apolitical or neutral endeavor. And the last thing I want to talk about here is this rereading of racialization. This was perhaps the most jarring and the most necessary rereading um, from our PAR project, our PAR endeavors. Um, and this centered around race and the racialization, uh, racializing practices rather, and discourses in school. So before the project, we all had this sense that students of color, um, particularly black students, experience schools, um, schooling in ways that constrains their opportunities and achievement. But PAR really um, engaged us in explicit discussions of white supremacy and the ways whiteness dictates classroom norms. It allowed us a new way of collectively and critically reflecting on our lived experiences um, in the way that we might lack a critical understanding of reality if we aren't able to thread together the fragments of how we understand the world of the world. And so we began to see that we are, in fact, oftentimes engaging in saviorism, whether it's intended or not. And the intention is not important, it's the impact that is important. Um, this project, as Melissa says, this project really solidified this thought of mine that intentions aren't what's important. What's important is the effect. And like, regardless of your intentions, if the effect is negative, that's what really matters. This required a huge, a huge dose of humility um, by all of us in acknowledging and speaking to the ways that um, we ourselves were per perpetuating inequity. And we wanted to do that at a level where we could name the actions of that, not the discursive mental construction of something, um, but what we were actually doing that was leading to further inequity. Um, so that humility became a huge part of our reflection. And what was really important is on the surface, you think that explorations of the school to prison pipeline don't necessarily tie to um, language education in ways that are obvious um, uh, on the surface. But when you think about the way that language is racialized, um, by navigating the PAR process, we were able to draw parallels to the way that schooling um, and policy have framed Black students as problems and the way that language is also framed as a problem in our schools. And that parallel was um, kind of, eye well, it was eye-opening for us because we recognize that there's this hierarchy, this arbitrary um, and discriminatory hierarchy and notions of prestige embedded in language that are enacted in parallel ways in terms of race. Um, and race became a material reality for us in, in ways that we hadn't quite considered race as property um, prior to this project. And this also led into our last sort of big aha, and it's this desocialization. Um, liberatory learning involves desocialization. And we see here, oops, um, whether intentional or unintentional, we can uphold racism and hierarchies within language and superiority between native and non-native speakers and so many more things. From this, I learned that one of my new teaching philosophies is that to be the best teacher you can be, you always have to be examining who you are. You have to look at who you are as a person, what values you have, how your personal identity can affect your classroom and your students. I have to look at my experiences with education and how I have learned to teach 
and also how my whiteness can influence my teaching approaches. And I know that with this, and I can't see the bottom part because my Zoom screen is in the way, but you can read that, I have faith. Um, so overall, PAR was, was truly transformative for us. It provoked and it disrupted our understandings of the eyes, the mouths, and the ears of whiteness. And we learned to appreciate the discomfort in that discovery. So I'm gonna end here with this idea of social justice. We all know that social justice is a loaded term and I will not even begin to attempt to untangle that for you today, which might leave you unsatisfied, but I wanna offer you an alternative. When we come into these spaces, a lot of these notions are being tossed around and, and we're engaging with them in different ways, um, but that's okay. I uh, drew oftentimes in my work on this notion of the ethic of incommensur incommensurability, um, which Tuck and Yang describe as um, rather than the goal of political unity with commonly shared objectives, um, this ethic acknowledges that we can collaborate for a time together, even while anticipating that our pathways towards enacting liberation will diverge. Incommensurability means that we cannot judge each other's justice projects by the same standard, but we can come to understand the gap between our viewpoints and thus work together in contingent collaboration. So ultimately at the end of the day, working in PAR allowed us to create a living theory of social justice that was applicable to our work on what it meant to be a critical intercultural teacher. Um, and I just wanna point out here in prior classes to PAR, um, I had never had students attend so much to this notion of identity and community. Students as knowledge producers and the notion of action. So these three concepts were relatively new discoveries in comparison to how I had previously taught this course. Um, I do have some contradictions, but I wanna get to some time to ask questions. So I will end there um, with a huge thank you to um, listening to me in my reflective space here. Um, and I look forward to your questions and please reach out to me if you have uh, any further questions or dialogue opportunities. Thanks, Amanda. Um, there's been lots of really positive feedback in the chat. And um, I have to say just personally, um, this has been inspirational for me. A lot of what you talked about is dovetailing with the thinking and the researching that I've been doing lately. So mm -hmm. I, um, I really appreciate everything that you had to say today. So far, there aren't any, um, any questions in the chat. I, so I can start it off with a question. Um, as I was listening to you define what participatory action research is, I was thinking, I don't know if you're familiar with Hackman's model, um, the five components of social justice education, which are uh, content mastery, personal reflection, critical thinking and action and social change. And then the fifth one is about creating multilingual, multicultural communities in the classroom. And I just wondered if you were familiar with that model and if you've thought at all about intersections between that model for social justice education and participatory action research. Um, yeah, so I haven't actually worked um, too much with that model, so I don't think I can um, comment too much. Um, I am very much right now in my work um, looking at things from a Ferrarian perspective, um, which comes with a whole host of other considerations, of course. Um, but I think anytime that we offer the opportunity to um, name intersections and explore intersections um, of, of anything that we're doing and that they're action-based. I think that is really important for how I view social justice. Um, I don't know if I could speak to other approaches because uh, you know there's so much diversity in, in the way that we conceptualize social justice, even within particular frameworks. Um, and so I, I think that's the best I can do in terms of my comment uh, with you there because I'm just not as uh, well versed in, in the particular model. Um, but I would welcome uh, if you the connections you've made after hearing this talk with that model if you have anything to add there. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, we can talk about that off hmm. off the 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 um, the Zoom. I, I actually there's some, or I mean, off of this um, meeting, but there's actually some questions in here that maybe might be more interesting for you to entertain. So, um, one comes from. I'm assuming uh, you pronounced your name, John. If I've mispronounced it, please uh, forgive me. Um, how can we break the boundaries that we as educators may encounter in certain communities with social justice topics? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a really important question. And I, I will actually reframe the question if I may take the liberty in doing so. Um, I think the idea of breaking boundaries really requires the an understanding of who is doing the breaking and who is defining the boundaries, if you will. Um, I think as teacher educators, um, and I will go back to um, my slide here um, so you all can view that. Um, I think as teacher educators and the work we're doing, um, we need to recognize that we don't have the singular power to do any of that breaking or to do any of that defining. And one of the contradictions I'm grappling with a lot in my work is this notion of community. Um, I think the future of equity, you know, education for equity lies in, in the community. We've known this for a long time now. Um, and so when I'm working with PAR in my community space, there's an understanding that to a degree community is inauthentic or um, artificial because we're collecting a group of students and putting them um, by nature of convenience into a singular space. And so the, the breaking of boundaries for that particular type of community would look very different from um, a community uh, out in the world that um, is already community without somebody having to force it into a box of what a community can look like. And so the breaking of those boundaries are really important. And I think it's, it's crucial that we understand, again, that any kind of PAR work is truly relational. It involves deep work with who we are as, as individuals, who we are as a community, um, what voices we're privileging, what voices we're disprivileging in these discussions. Um, and it really requires that humility to understand when we should not be in a particular space, when the community members own that space and we cannot have ownership over, over that. And so I know this isn't really answering your question because I think anytime we're talking about criticality, the answer is always, it depends. Um, but thinking about that community and being explicit in our reflection about those boundaries and the definitions of those, um, I think is always going to be one of the initial steps in any kind of movement towards uh, breaking anything, if you will. Yeah, thanks, uh, Amanda. There's, I know we're getting close to the end of the hour, but there's one question that, um, has been asked and that has been kind of upvoted by a couple of the folks in the chat. So I, if you have the time, yeah. I'll go ahead and ask it. So the question is from Luis and they ask, what could or should be the key features of an intercultural teacher? Mm. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I will share here the screen. Um, I think there are many models that talk about this. Um, for me, I'm less concerned with particular models. We always talk about knowledges um, and skills um, and experiences. Um, so obviously those have something to do with it, right? Um, I think in a critical intercultural teacher recognizes that interculturality is always going to be framed in discussions of power and power is always going to be tied to um, these larger systems. So we uh, understanding our roles in our little microcosms of our classroom um, really, under, really requires us to understand these larger um, issues and we can't have one without the other. So I think for me, if I'm conceptualizing a critical intercultural teacher, the ability 
to make sense of these things um, and also the desire to explore our own humility and understanding the ways that we think about the world and the ways that we don't think about the world at the same time. I think that's a very crucial characteristic of a critical intercultural teacher. And I think if we want to um, I think about this as a journey, um, more adept or skilled intercultural teachers will be able to further nuance this notion of power and who can have power and who has ownership. Um, uh, this is this is my own postulating, if you will, um, who can have ownership of power, because I find that in, in my work, a lot of teachers, they'll get to this moment of realization that power is always present, but it remains in this dichotomizing, somebody always has the power and somebody always doesn't have the power. But it's more finite than that. It's more nuanced than that, um, particularly if we're thinking um, post-structurally in, in how we're thinking about interactions. And so um, I actually do a discourse analysis project in my class that targets specifically um, uh, my teacher's uh, reflection on stories they've told and they have to analyze those for power. And it allows them to see the ebbs and flows in a visual way. Um, and I think that's been very successful for my students and very eye-opening as well. Long-winded. Okay. No, it was great. Thanks, Amanda. There's actually, as you can see in the chat, people are very excited to hear your response to this question. So, mm -hmm. so we've reached the end of the hour, and we want to be respectful of everybody's time, including Amanda's. So, um, thank you all for coming, and thank you to Amanda for this great talk. Um, I, I, I mean, the chat obviously is showing us just how people were affected by what you said today, and in positive and inspiration, inspirational ways. So thank you so much for sharing your research thank with us. You. And thanks to all of you for coming. And we hope that we'll see you at the next Carla talk next week. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you for coming.